objectives here. Actually, actually, we may touch on all of them. So we'll take a look at that when we're done. So this is a warranty that you may not be familiar of. It makes, it makes quite a bit of sense. And that is that um, when somebody sells the product, that it's theirs to sell to you. Right? Makes sense. Like you, you mentioned Best Buy, you go to Best Buy, you buy a video camera, that it's yours. <laughs> and it was theirs. And there aren't any liens on it. Nobody's going to come knocking at your door and say, hey, Best Buy hasn't been paying the bills, we want the, the camera back, right? So uh, they have good title, there aren't any liens on the property, and no infringements. They're, they're, you know, if you buy a DVD, it's not a bootleg DVD. It's the only type of warranty that you also warrant. You warrant that you won't infringe on anybody's copyright while you own it. So you won't make duplicate, duplicates of that DVD. And then the last point up there, a disclaimer is trying to avoid. So a disclaimer of title warranty is somebody saying, here, we'll sell you this, but we don't warrant we have good title. How do you guys feel about that? Does that sound like a good idea? If you get something and you look at the fine print and it says, eh, we're not really sure if we own it, but if we do, it's yours, it doesn't seem like a, a good thing. So something to watch out for. When somebody says, we make no warranties of title, that means, well, we're selling you and we think it's ours, but if that becomes a problem later, we're not going to do anything about it. Not good. All right, now this is where it starts to sound a lot like contracts. Remember express contracts? Now we have express warranties. And express means what? <laughs> it means, yeah, it means expressed orally or in writing. Good. We remember that from last chapter. Now this takes it a little further. The expression could be what somebody says about their product, what somebody writes in a, a written warranty about their product, or notice the second bullet there, a model or sample is an expression of what yours should be like. This is really um, timely because my wife and I are shopping for a new vehicle. Um, we've had the same van for close to 10 years. It has quite a few miles on it. And I don't know, I think I may have mentioned to you on the way back from Chicago and all that nasty weather, it started sputtering. And I probably shouldn't put in this recording because I might try to sell it to somebody. But. <laughs> Um, it, it, you, I'm, I'm like all the way home. I'm like, if if I make it home, you're you're going. You're, I'm, you're history. I don't want you anymore. I was talking to the van. What? No, it's a Ford Windstar. And um, I've already replaced the transmission in it once, which, if people know anything about Windstars, apparently is not a, a big surprise. Uh, and also, you ever heard of the a, a catalytic converter? See, I don't know much about mechanics. I thought it only had one. So I replaced it all once, and now it's doing the same thing again. I'm, I'm sick of it. So it's going bye-bye. I, I try not to talk about it in front of it, but it's just between us. Um, so I get, my point is that when, when we, went, we, went, we started looking this weekend, let my wife test drive different vehicles. Of course, everything she's driving, I'm like, oh, this is wonderful, right? Because <laughs> what she's been driving is a 10-year-old piece of junk. She's like, I like it. I'll take it. I'm like, hold on. Let's try some other ones. Uh, but whatever she drives should be like what we get, right? Mm -hmm. Like even if we order it, when it comes in, it shouldn't have a different engine or whatever unless we ask for something different. So it should be like what they um, have us drive. Uh, a warranty has to be the basis of the bargain. And, uh, you know, I think major things are. Like I said, the engine that it has in it, how many seats, you know, all those type of things are part of the bargain. I think even paint color probably is part of the bargain. You know, if I order something and it comes in at a different color, I should be able to say, don't want it. That's not. Well, wouldn't be, you know, I think... 
Uh, what if somebody said orally to me, uh, there's no damage on this vehicle, which is a dumb thing to say, right? And then I find a little scratch. Does this sound familiar? The whole, I painted the whole room, but I find a little, you know, and then I go, oh, no, warranty. You breached a warranty. You expressed to me that it didn't have any flaws on it. And look, I found one, you know. That's probably not the whole basis of the bargain. I mean, I didn't rely on that when making the purchase of the vehicle. But, you know, if it's been in a flood, <laughs> right? Hail. Hail or something, you know, it's had severe damage and, you know, I, that's not expressed to me, then that, that could be a problem. Statements of opinion or value do not create express warranties. So, um, when the salesperson says, you look good in that, you know, first of all, that's probably a lie. Um, but, you know, it's just an opinion, it's puffery, it's something that's said not to really to get me, I mean, maybe it does get me to rely on it, but it's not really something that should be considered a warranty. Like, I bring it back, hey, I don't look good in this. <laughs> I stopped at a stoplight, somebody looked at me and looked away quickly. Uh, Yeah, I know, exactly. It's my fault. All right, so those are express warranties. Oral, written, model, samples. You guys can think of many examples of this. Now, these are implied warranties, which, just like contracts, implied means what? Not express, right? These are things that through the law or through the conduct of the parties or the facts imply a warranty. I'll see if you guys read the chapter. What type of seller must the seller be to create the implied warranty of merchant ability? Let me try again. Implied warranty of merchant ability. A merchant. Very good. So this type of warranty is automatically implied in any sale by a merchant. Who's a merchant? Meyer's a merchant, right? They sell the same type of goods over and over again, lots of different types of goods. Who's not a merchant? Probably. I mean, like selling things one time at your garage sale probably doesn't make you a merchant. Could you be a merchant selling things out of your house? Yes. So, you know, the law tries to address different situations, like selling cars. Usually you sell one car out of your front lawn, probably not a merchant. But if you're a dealer who's selling cars out of your front yard, then probably you're a merchant. Yeah, like eBay right, I, yeah, I think that's one that uh, could be factual. Like my father-in-law, he, he makes a living on eBay. He sells stuff all the time. He's so funny. We see him on weekends, and he's leaving early to go to garage sales, buy stuff that people sell for nothing, turns around and sells it on eBay for way more than it's worth. It's incredible what people will pay for stuff on eBay. He went out and he picked up this, like, Swiss espresso machine, five bucks, sold it for hundreds of dollars. Uh, so... Um, are, are there merchants on eBay? Yeah, there, there are stores, companies who, who sell. That's one of their outlets for selling. He may even be considered a merchant as to some things. All right, so, and there's different uh, settings here. For example, food could be merchantable. Goods could be merchantable. Now, here's my own definition. I mean, it says up there, Merchantable goods are reasonably fit for the ordinary purpose for which goods are used. I like to say, the good's good for what it's good for. That's my little twist on it. So, um, food's good for eating, right? TVs are good for watching. So if they explode, that's a breach of the implied warranty merchantability, right? Because they shouldn't do that. That's not, they're no longer good for what they're good for. I would think, big, would say blue line, on the TV, you know, that would be, I think, a breach of that implied warranty. Um, anybody see that case? Read the case 13.1. Webster versus Blue Ship Tea Room. 
I haven't had fish chowder. I think I've had clam chowder, but not fish chowder. But did you guys know fish has bones? They have bones in them? I know. Shocking. You had to wait this long in the semester to learn that. But um, Yeah, that's the point of this case, which is an oldie. But um, it's still a goodie. And that is, if you read the case, in the end, the question was what? Somebody read the case? How about back up? What happened? Right. I think it was a she, but um, she ended up getting a bone lodged in her throat and ended up having to have you know, medical treatment surgery and um, argued that a bone in fish chowder is a breach of the implied warranty of merchantability. What did the court say? Is it? They said, no, it's not a breach. And why did they say that? Right. Yeah, people, I mean, there's some, like, you could say boneless, and then it better be. But outside of that, if you serve something that naturally has bones in it, people should know that it has bones in it. And the part I don't like about this case is the court even goes further than that. What do they say about that region? Like, where is this case from? Yeah. Right. So um, the, the court says, you of all people who's from this area should know, which I guess in a way probably is true. I mean, like being from around here, I guess there are Great Lakes around here, but, you know, fish chowder is not as popular here as it probably is there. So, um, but yeah, I think most people, most reasonable people know fish doesn't have, or fish has bones in it, and there's a possibility that it might have some in it. Now, what might fish chowder have in it that would be breach of the implied warranty of merchantability? Glass. Yeah, yeah. If it had something that really is not supposed to be in there, finger, glass, whatever, then I would think that would be a breach of the implied warranty. Right? Or if it said it's boneless, then I think that would be a breach of an express warranty. Uh, so food that makes you sick, you know, getting food poisoning, those type of things, that seems like a breach of the implied warranty. Uh, let's say I'm going to go skiing. Um, I go into Bill and Paul's and I ask for some snow skis. The skis they sell me, even without saying a word, because they're a merchant as to skis, should be able to do what? Go on snow, right? They sh I should be able to ski on them. So if they don't, that'd be a problem, yeah. Okay. So Jack this movie once. <laughs> what is the name of the movie? Skiing Todd. Oh, there you go. Yes. Well, there is a part in the film where the woman chops up humans and puts them in a meat pie. Right. She calls it yes. Meat Right, so is that a breach of a warranty? Yeah, does that make sense, though? No. <laughs> well, I that, but you know, you don't it's funny, I saw you in the hallway, I opened the door for you, you seem like a nice young lady, <laughs> and then you bring up chopping up people and putting them in pies. <laughs> it's a pressing question in my mind. Uh, yeah, you know, I suppose that, I mean, outside the movie, that question is, if you know there's something in there that people wouldn't be thinking about and you don't say anything dishonest, is that a problem? Right. So if you say meat pie, you just don't say what kind of meat, right? You know, is, is, that, is that a problem? <laughs> right. I think, like we were saying earlier, if it has something in it it shouldn't naturally have in it, then you have a duty to warn people. <laughs> I'm not going to go into any names. Let's stick with a fictional movie. Or not fictional. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think that you, you would have a duty to not put things in there that shouldn't be in there or to warn people that you've put things in there that shouldn't be in there. Well, again, um, I mean, I think there are places where they serve foods that you wouldn't, like being from around here, may not expect to see. But if you know what it is, I don't see that as a problem, right? Like if you order horse or, well, that's a bad example. That sounds very animal cruelty. What? Shark fin soup. Shark fin soup, right? Yeah, you should know that there's shark in it. Is there? I don't know. I've never had shark fin soup. I'm imagining it doesn't. Does it have a fin in it? So yeah, I think you could have. I, I think that's a good point. You could have a duty to warn of peop, people of things that are in there that shouldn't be in there, or that they wouldn't expect to be in there. All right. The implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. This, oops, I, think, I don't think that whole slide's up there, is it? There it is. This warranty does not automatically arise in every sales transaction. Notice it doesn't say that up there. This warranty does not require a merchant. In other words, this warranty could be created by either a merchant or a non-merchant. So you could create this selling something out of your garage. So I go into Bill and Paul's and I don't just say I want a pair of skis. I say, you know, I do a lot of high altitude helicopter jumping, which, you know, I do. And uh, I need uh, special skis that can survive at high altitude jumping from a helicopter without breaking, yada, yada, yada. Uh, if they hand me a pair of skis and being the expert say, then these are what you need, then there's this additional warranty created that the skis are not only good for skiing on, but they will meet my particular purpose. So in order to have this warranty, the merchant or non-merchant has to know exactly what I need it for. Knowing what I need it for, they make a specific recommendation to me. And then I rely on that recommendation, which means I buy whatever they tell me to buy. Because if I throw the skis aside and say, you don't know what you're talking about and take another pair, then there's no implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose because I haven't relied on their recommendation. This reminds me of when I was buying a snowblower. I mentioned to you guys already that I'm not mechanically too me mechanically inclined. Uh, I knew I wanted a snowblower where I didn't have to mix oil and gas. You know, I just knew I just want to pour gas in and never change the oil. No, you know. I, and it'd be good, right? So I go into Sears for some reason. It was right there. And um, there's a bunch of people standing around, none in the department I want to be in. And I ask one of them to come over and help me. And they all say, well, we don't know anything about them, but we'll try. Um, what happens when you go in the store and you ask the salesperson whether that product will meet their purpose. What do they usually do? Yeah, they read. If they can, they <laughs> grab the box. Seriously, I mean, when I go in a store and I ask for something, I, somebody just stands there, pulls the box out, and reads me the box. Thank you. That's not really what I'm looking for. Um, I went to Best Buy, and I, I was buying a a computer to go behind a flat screen monitor. So it was a small computer. Yeah, and I, and I wanted to, to be wireless because where I was installing the flat panel, there wasn't a network connection. 
So I said to the salesperson, I need a wireless card that will go in this very thin computer. The guy walks over, picks up a box and says, this one will work. And I'm like, I'm looking at the computer, I'm looking at this big box and I'm going, I don't think so. I said, are you sure? Because it seems like the card's bigger than the computer. <laughs> oh yeah, this will work. All right. I question that, but I'm not going to open the computer here, so I'll bring it back if it doesn't. Sure enough, there was no stinking way this card was going to fit into this computer, so I brought it back. Um, he, he didn't know what he was talking about. So I've discovered, no offense if you work at Lowe's, but if you know what you're doing, go to Lowe's and just get it. But if you don't know what you're doing and you want to help, go to Gemmins in Hudsonville. Just a little. Because <laughs> there's, a, there's a bunch of retired guys that work there. Done everything. And when you ask them a question, you're like, I'm looking for this. They don't, they're not happy with that. They say, well, what are you going to do? Before. And then knowing what it is that you're going to do, They'll tell you you're wrong. They'll say, no, that's not going to work. You need this. And when they give you that, you walk out of there going, okay. They knew what they were talking about. And you're relying on it. So what does that do? That says whatever they just gave you should do what those type of goods ordinarily do. But it should also meet your particular purpose. Now, I have a theory that they actually train salespeople at Best Buy and Lowe's not to give you any advice. <laughs> really? To read you the box or just say it's in aisle 12 and not go with you. Because they don't want to create this additional warranty. Am I wrong? Does anybody work in retail where, I don't know. I mean, I think it's hard to be an expert about everything but come on, I mean, if you work with this stuff long enough, don't you pick up something? Yes. You'd think. And I made a mistake. I was putting in a toilet for the first time <laughs> in our basement. Never put in a toilet before. I was nervous. I'm like, you know, what if, <laughs> what if something happens? It doesn't seal right or whatever. So um, I went to Lowe's hoping that I'd find the smart person there who knew how to put a toilet in. No luck. So I went to Gemmins. They squared me away. For whatever it's worth. You're an attorney and you're putting in a toilet. Yes. Yeah. And I let people know that. I'm like, legal training, yes. I can crank out a will, no problem. Plumbing, hate it. Right? You know? I, you know, same thing with uh, going to a car dealer. You know, car dealers are really funny. You know, I can go to a car dealer and I can say, you know, I'm not super mechanically inclined. And they treat me with respect. If I was a woman, they would take advantage of me. I just got to say. I don't, I don't know if you guys have had that experience. Not you guys because you're not women. But women, have you had that experience? Like just even if you don't say anything, they just naturally assume you're idiots and don't know anything about mechanics. I don't know, maybe that's a generalization. But in my experience, when I watch how people treat me and treat my wife, like, yes, this is a door. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, anyway, so this is an additional warranty that may arise with a, with a merchant or a non-merchant if the conditions are right. And what are the conditions? What do you have to have to have this additional warranty? Right, you gotta you gotta let them know. I'm at, I'm stressing this because you're gonna see this, right? You're gonna be faced with a scenario, and you're gonna have to figure out: Did the person give them enough information? Like I go, I went into Lowe's one time and I said, I'm putting down tile. Again, no idea what I was doing. I'm going to put down tile. At least I got to give Lowe's credit. The person said, where? Right? Because bathroom tile versus, I was actually putting tile down in my basement on concrete floor. There's a big difference between those two applications. 
So at least they asked me, and then they steered me in the right direction. Actually, it came out pretty well. So now I know how to do tile floors, more or less. <laughs> so um, you, they have to know your particular purpose. They have to make a recommendation. Because even if I go in and say, this is what I need it for, and they're like, yeah, it's over there, that's not enough, right? They, they go over there with me, and they go, well, then you need that. But you also have to be careful when they go, you need that, that that isn't, you need the most expensive thing in the store, and I still have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Because I get that too. All right. And then watch for the whole, either the person relies on the other person's recommendation or they don't. Now, you could have overlapping warranties. So we talked about these different types of warranties, express and writing, oral, samples, models, implied warranties, merchantability, implied warranties, fitness, particular purpose. So you might have more than one warranty. Think about it. You go in a store and ask for something, and the salesperson makes representations to you. Um, and then you open the box, and there's a written warranty in the box. Well, those both could be warranties. Certainly the written one is, and what they say to you might be also. For the previous, um, the implied warranty of fitness for a specific, mm -hmm. particular purpose, how, like, how does that work with opinion? Like if they say, well, I think this is a better product, and then the person goes home and says, well, I don't think it is a better product. Right, I th yeah, I think opinions about whether a product is better or worse is not what we're talking about. We're talking about whether it meets a specific purpose or need. So um, another thing I'm not real good at is um, home theater equipment. I, I, it's funny, I keep saying I'm not good at things, but I put in everything myself. Like I, like I put in our underground sprinkling, not good at that. But I learn a lot while I do these things. So I put in, um, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. But at least I spread it out over time. <laughs> you know, if I counted all the, uh, the heads that I've sheared off with my lawnmower, probably. Um, but anyway. So, uh, oh, yeah, back to st uh, stereo equipment. So I have this old receiver that will not recognize sources. Like It just keeps switching around on me. It's possessed, right? So I'm going to go into someplace, I'm not sure where, because there's not a lot of options. If you want to walk in someplace and get home theater equipment, what, what is, I mean, Circuit City's out of business. Yeah, Best Buy. Yeah, Best Buy. So anyway, so if I go in there and they go, oh, Ankyo's better than whatever, Denon. Are those two? That's audio, right? <laughs> um, and I go home and I'm like, oh, uh, uh that's not what we're talking about. But um, if if they tell me, if I say I need a 7.1 surround, that 7.1 is a type, right? If I say 7.1 and they go, oh, then you need this, and it's not, then I think that is a direct, you know, that is an implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, and it didn't meet my purpose. It might still work, but it may not drive my back speaker, right, my back channel, if that's what they call it. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Warranty disclaimers. Remember, disclaimers are attempt to avoid, get out of. So the point here is that if you can have warranties flying all over the place, you might try to do something to not have them. That's why when you walk onto a used car lot, what do you see in the windows of the cars? As right, white piece of paper, check as is, with all faults, no warranties. Or it might say, you know, whatever's left in the manufacturer's warranty, or only 90 days, only on certain parts, or something like that. So they will often do what they can to restrict what warranties go on it, because they know their salespeople are going to say crazy things to get you to buy it. Some of them, some of the things they say will only be opinion, 
other things will be represented to you as fact to get you to rely on it and buy it. So notice the top one, disclaimer express warranties. The court does not like when a seller tries to avoid a written or oral representation. Doesn't that make sense? You know, you rely on something somebody said or wrote out to you, and then in the fine print it says, ignore everything we said or wrote out to you. <laughs> does that, I mean, it makes a little bit of sense. Like you go to sign the paperwork on your car and it says, don't pay attention to what our crazy salespeople may have represented to you or what you believe they represented to you. This is it. This is the only warranty. So it, it makes a little bit of sense that they would try to do that. So if it's conspicuous, which means what? Right, it's where you can plainly see it. Big print, black and white, not, you know, I mean, font that stands out, not in the fine print, small, difficult to understand language at the very back of the contract, and you know about it when you reach the agreement, not like afterward. Then maybe the court will buy that you have waived express warranty. In other words, they really want you to, you, to know that you saw and agreed to the waiver. Then the implied warranties. If you use the right language, the court will consider it an effective waiver. That's why it says as is on the car. And where does it talk about this in your chapter? There's a, there's a specific section in your chapter that talks about implied warranties and warranty disclaimers. Anybody find the page number for that? I heard lots of numbers there. 364. Yeah, so it starts in the bottom page of 363 for express warranty disclaimers. And then, yeah, it's uh, on page 364, implied warranties. And it says disclaim disclaimer of implied warranty and merchantability and warranty of fitness. Well, it depends. <laughs> so um, you've got a number of conflicting potential warranties there, right? You, the dealer's saying as is, and they ought to act like as is. And when you come to them with a particular purpose and you rely on their representation, you might make the argument, well, you did try to disclaim the implied warranties, but you specifically warranted this. And then the court decides whether you knew as is meant as it is. Right? So it, it, there's not an easy answer to that question. They're going to argue what? That, it, well, maybe you had some discussions about that, but you knew that you got it as you got it. And if it worked, it did. And what should you probably have done? Got in and tried it, right? I mean, don't don't just rely on somebody's represent. If it's as is, don't just rely on somebody's representation. It'll work for your purpose. Get in there and try it out. All right. Um, which is the last point here? That sometimes um, the seller can argue, look. Whatever it is that you believe you were relying on, you shouldn't have relied on what we said. You should have just checked. So 
when we when we test drive vehicles, you know, if we go into a dealer and we say, "Does it have a smooth ride?" and they say, "Yes, it has a smooth ride." Doesn't that sound like a express warranty? Yes, it has a smooth ride. But what should we probably do? I mean, smooth is very subjective. Smooth to to who? Right? What's that? Right. Yeah, and you know, so everything we drive seems a lot better than what we have. But uh, and you you've seen that term unconscionability before. If whatever they're attempting to disclaim is so shocking, the court may not enforce it. So I think situations where they um, put things in writing and sign it, they disclaim everything they put in writing, courts are not real excited about enforcing. Right? They're saying, well, maybe the consumer did sign and agree, but it's just unfair to do that to them. All right, the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act doesn't create new warranties. That's not its purpose. Its purpose is to make warranties easier for consumers to understand. It's for, enforced by the FTC. It doesn't require that you have a written warranty, but if you have a written warranty and you label it as a full warranty, that means free repair or replacement for the lifetime of the product. No limitations. Yeah? Well, do you mean you're not talking about insurance, you're talking about warranty? I don't know of a uh, warranty that doesn't have some restriction on an automobile. Like there's a restriction on mileage, parts, what they'll do to fix it, how long. If there is, let, let me know because I want to get that one. They've canceled it since then, but back around 04 to Seven or so, Dodge had a lifetime powertrain warranty. Yeah, on the powertrain. Yeah. So not the rest. But that'd yeah. be full warranty on the powertrain, right? Well, I suppose it matters how they do the warranty. Most warranties are, here's the warranty on the car, and it differs depending on what part you're talking about. Like, um, I blew up the engine in my Jeep, and um, I didn't want to spend a lot of money on it. And so I got a rebuilt engine, and I got a very limited warranty in terms of how long it, what, I mean, it, the first warranty I looked at is the warranty on the vehicle and whether it was even covered or not, which it wasn't. It was well outside of any warranty. But um, not only was it restrictive to like 90 days, <laughs> that's how cheap it was, but also... I had to put oil in it like every day or something. <laughs> it was like you had, to, you had to put oil in the engine every 3,000 miles, and you had to document that you did or the warranty was void, which um, that could have been how I got in the problem in the first place. <laughs> That's true. So... Um, yeah. Uh, implied warranties are created under the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, not this act. So if you question about how they're created or how they're disclaimed, you look to the UCC. Uh, a limited warranty is any limitation on a full warranty. So if it says for a period of time, certain amount of mileage, whatever, I blew up another vehicle just just a few miles after the warranty was over. In fact, when I started the trip, it was under warranty, and then it blew up, and then when they towed it to the lot, they're like, oh, man, you're just over warranty. 
Now I think back, I'm pretty rough on vehicles. <laughs> so are there, are there very many products that come with full warranty? Um, well, I think that um, manufacturers kind of look at the um, value to their reputation sometimes. And for smaller ticket items, say, yeah, if you ever have any problems with it, we'll fix it. But, you know, I think with things like cars, <laughs> that would be extremely expensive. That's one reason why Dodge got rid of their lifetime. Right, I, yeah, I mean, like, people keep them forever, and then every time something goes wrong with it, you'd be responsible for fixing it. So, yeah. Hey, um, Timberland, like, they do the blue like, right Right. Yeah. yeah. So some, yeah, that's a good example. Um, these shoes are, like, if ever, anything ever goes wrong with them, I'm like, really? Anything ever? Like, you don't know me. I destroy everything. <laughs> yep, anything. Yeah. I think they still do. Yeah, they still do. Yeah. You can take the broken one to Sears and they give you a brand new one. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how it happened. Give it to your kid and they'll break it. You can still. You can find one on the side of the road. Ooh, good idea. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's find tools and take them back and get new ones. Awesome. That's my kind of tool. I need one of those warranties. Yeah, so I guess to answer your question, there are a few examples of, you know, companies that just say, this is just our reputation. We'll replace it no matter what. All right, Lemon Laws, a new addition to the textbook. If you have the old edition of the textbook, you probably don't see this. Um, but, you know, you commonly associate there may be others. I mean, generally, lemon laws say if you have a problem with the product, uh, in most cases, it's when the product is new and you've taken steps to try to get it repaired and the seller can't fix it after a certain number of times, then there's a remedy for you. So back in the day, there, you know, still today, there are people who get something new believing that they won't have problems with it. But every once in a while, anybody ever had a lemon? Like there's something? Like what was your? Right, brand new, spanking new, should work, should be no problems, but the thing just doesn't work right. Crash. <laughs> yeah, so it can happen, right? At computers, it can happen to cars or whatever, but uh, it's statutory. So you can ask me, well, does the Lemon Law cover this or that? Does it cover used cars? Does it cover leases? Whatever the statute says it covers. Yeah. Okay. It says it usually covers four attempts to fix it. What sort of timeline within those four? Months? Statutory. Okay. So however, however long the period is, whether it's new or used, and what Michigan's current length of time is, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. Um, but that's kind of the way most of them work. It says within a certain period of time, there's a certain number of repairs, and then there's debate about whether the seller took reasonable actions to fix it or not. You know, so um, it might be replacing the defective part or being able to take it back, which was a big point for people. They're like, okay, you keep fixing the problem, but it's an inconvenience because. I shouldn't keep having the same problem again. Usually, um, if you read the fine print, in exchange for kind of having this right for people over an extended period of time to take back something that's new, um, consumers are kind of put in a position to resolve those claims through arbitration. And you usually see that in a contract if you purchase a new vehicle. All right, product liability. So we're leaving warranty land and we're going into torts. Not unfamiliar territory. Negligence is one of those theories that we've already seen. If you remember, negligence is when somebody owes a duty 
they breach that duty, somebody's harmed by that breach. So negligence in this context, because we're talking about uh, products, goods, notice it says the manufacturers, sellers, and lessors of goods can be liable if defective good causes an injury. That means somebody who sells me the good but didn't make it could be held responsible. You've got to think about that a minute. That doesn't seem entirely fair. But the law presumes that the seller, if they're going to sell it and it has a defect that causes an injury to somebody, should be responsible. And then it says, privity of contract is not required. Privity of contract means a direct contractual relationship. How many of you, if you bought a car, went right to the manufacturer to get it? I had one student one time like, well, actually, I did. I went to the plant and they made it for me. Okay. <laughs> That's the way he talked. I guess. <laughs> you, ever met, you ever met, well, actually? Like whatever you say, they're like, well, actually. Um, anyway, but outside that one guy, most people don't go to the plant to get their vehicle, right? They get it at a dealer who got it from another dealer. Yada, yada, yada. Or auction. What's that? Right, yeah, maybe. Certainly that's possible. It was shipped directly to the dealer who sold it. But point is, regardless, if they sold it, they're on the line. There's a defect in it. And notice, and some of these slides go into more detail about this, but when we say negligence, here's some of the different ways that the manufacturer could be negligent. How the product is designed, the materials that go in it, maybe the design's fine, but with the stuff they put in it was defective, or how they put it together was defective, or even... The warning could be defective. L listen, I'm not saying the product is defective, but the warning isn't right. There's not enough warning. Or it doesn't warn correctly. The, the defect's in the warning that's on it. So when you get in my Jeep, it says the common things like put on your seat belt, don't put your kid in the front seat if they're in a baby seat because the airbag will kill them. Right? But it also says things like, don't make real sharp turns. This thing rolls over real easy. Um, don't, uh, don't sit too close to the airbag. Like even if you have your seatbelt on, but you get right up against an airbag, it'll, it'll really hurt you. So it says that too. So there are a number of things that it lists as things that you shouldn't do. Anybody seen a strange warning? Right? Really, manufacturers have a duty to warn of risk and even foreseeable misuse of the product. Yeah? Right. Unless what? Right. So there's different charts depending on what kind of driver you are or the conditions that you're in. Yeah. Uh, I've seen some weird labels. Maybe some of them will come to mind. Just I think the warning labels on hot beverages are kind of weird. Why? If you buy a hot coffee, obviously it's going to be hot. Yes. Your cup to remind you that. Right. Yes, when I ordered my coffee, I asked for it extra hot. But the warning doesn't say it's extra hot. <laughs> Maybe because I already know that. Yeah, um, adequate warning for ordinary persons. You know, like, who's a brilliant multitasker who took a hairdryer into the tub? 
Yeah, you know, there's that warning on there. But who, who was the first person that did that? Went, oh, this is, this is a bad idea. We better put a warning on there, right? I, yeah. I mean, I don't have that issue. My hair dries pretty fast, but it seems like it just would be common sense. My lawnmower says, um, don't stick your hands under it, which, you know, seems like, right, yeah. Um, but it also has another warning. It says, don't trim your hedges with it. People, <laughs> people have been known to pick, I'm, I'm talking about pushing them out, not writing, but to pick these things up and use them to trim their hedges with. So there's a warning on your, uh, well, on new lawnmowers that say that. Say that. Yeah. So don't get me started on warning on vacuums. That's, I don't really want to get into that. But. Uh, misrepresentation. So another theory is that what somebody told you about the product or the labeling that was on the product was inaccurate or uh, somebody concealed something from you. And if they concealed it, and you're harmed, then you should be able to recover for it. It's the whole duty to, to warn people of stupid things that they do that kind of gets people. Like aerosol cans, what do they say? Don't puncture them, don't light them, and don't sniff them, right? But people do. All right, strict product liability. What's that? I think warnings are more of an invitation. <laughs> like I dare you type thing? Oh, maybe you think that. I don't know. <laughs> don't. Don't do it. Uh, strict liability from Chapter 4 meant liability without fault. So it doesn't matter whether somebody intended for you to be harmed or was negligent when they made the product. If you're harmed by the product and you meet the statutory requirements, then you get to recover. And notice the, the second bullet there, that maybe you're, you're watching the TV that blows up, but you're not the one that purchased it. You still should be able to recover. And we, we have these type of rules because we just feel it's better for the people who are making the money off of us to pay than consumers. And if they're the ones selling us the stuff that harms us, then they should be responsible for it. These requirements are in your chapter. I think they're numbered even. 368? Okay. I think it says one of them. I think the third one is often in statutes, not always. But, you know, it's again, it's statutory. So, like, if, if Lowe's, for example, is selling a product and it's, you know, it's not going to be Yes. Yeah, I mean, think back to, I mean, there's some old cases around where somebody's harmed by a car. Like, think, well, if they even think of recent cases, like, what was, Ford yeah, the Firestone case. You know, what does Firestone say? It's Ford. We told them not to put on this vehicle. We told them to inflate it properly, yada, yada, yada. It's their fault. And then Ford says, no, it's Firestone's fault. Or, no, it's not us, it's the, the rubber you know, it's so point and finger, you know, if you remember that litigation. Bottom line is, should the consumer have to follow all those rabbit trails of people pointing fingers at each other? No, they should be able to recover from whoever they want to recover from or can recover from and then let them sort it out. So Lowe's, you sold me a out of control Maytag, you know, it swallowed my kid and I don't know, I don't know what, it, what it would be, but um, you sue them, they sold it to you. It damaged you. Then they might turn around and say, look, we're selling something that you manufacture that's defective. Not your problem. I say sue everybody. 
I mean, I mean, you know what I mean. I don't mean everyone, but I mean anybody who could be responsible. You bring them in. You don't. You don't just say Lowe's when it was manufactured by somebody else. Or whoever the parts came from, the injury, whoever made it, whoever sold it, whoever looked at you funny. Yeah. Well, you can't be made more than whole. And uh, it's not even really up to you to try to figure out what percentage comes from who. But you just want to get your medical expenses or, you know, I don't know what the Maytag, maybe it flooded your house or whatever it is. So, so a product has to be defective when it's sold. Whoever sold it is in the business of selling those type of goods. Uh, it's, it's unreasonably dangerous or depends on the wording of the statute. Uh, it causes the injury, and the bottom one's kind of important too. The goods have not been, have not substantially changed from the time of the sale. That's why when you see, you see warnings about modifying stuff after you buy it, right? That usually, if you're responsible for your own injury because you modified a good, then that's your fault. Right? I, I did that. I put a little nitrous on our van. No, I didn't. But, um, you know, people do that kind of stuff. Anybody from Cedar Springs? <laughs> you know? Yeah, they, they, you know, they race tractors up there and stuff. Snowmobiles, whatever. I mean, they, they modify them. In Hudsonville, yeah. I haven't been to any tractor races. Well, I have been to tractor races in Hudsonville. I take that back. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, I was mentioning this class one time. One of my Two of my students said they built a daiquiri whacker, which is apparently a Dodge Hemi engine hooked up to a blender. <laughs> I guess that would probably grind up things pretty fast. Yeah. Yep. You'd think, yeah, it would make more sense, but they had hooked up a Dodge Hemi. All right. Um, so. Notice the first one. The plaintiff, the one who's injured, doesn't have to show how it became defective, just that it is. As long as it's not their own fault. And then, you know, there's some statutory definitions around what's an unreasonably danger, dangerous product. And we'll get into some, you know, things that people should know are dangerous. Like the knives in your drawer don't say caution sharp on them, right? Maybe they should. Maybe you should. No, I mean, I think the law would say sharp. There was this case about these uh, guys who were driving around. It wasn't in Hudsonville. Probably could have been, though. Um, shooting each other with in cars with paintball guns. They were in, yeah, they were in cars and they were chasing each other around and shooting at each other with paintball guns. And I was telling one of my classes about this. I'm like, I mean, everybody should know moving vehicle, shoot someone else in the face with a paintball, it hurts. <laughs> and they said, well, what if you freeze them? I hadn't even thought of this. Apparently, this. Then it would really hurt. That's what I said, too. Like, people take the paintballs and they freeze them. So they really hurt. We just played in, like, November. Yeah. And so they're freezing, like, on their own. Ah. Uh, so it does hurt. <laughs> There's first hand. Sorry. Hand, first hand. <laughs> Experience. Look at that. All right, so uh, we mentioned some of these already, the different types of defects that could be how the product was made, how it was designed. Maybe it's just a bad design. Seemed like a really good idea, but in implementation, things didn't come out too well. Or the warning. Anybody think of any other misuses for products? which aren't really dares. But. I had a big chunk of ice stuck in my... Yeah, there it is. What is that? Is that a... Uh, 
That's not a Hemi, obviously. A little weed whacker. Yeah. They must have went overboard. Good. Now I know what you do all class. That's right. I bet he's lying. Let's go, let's go look this up. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, my snowblower. Got some ice stuck in it. And there is a, um, it comes with this clip-on, uh, I don't know, handle wedge thing that you can use to clear out your snowblower. That just looks like an invitation for something bad to happen. <laughs> like, how many people leave the thing running and then shove how to fix a snowblower jam. Very good. How do you fix it? Probably shut it off or make sure that it's not engaged while you do it. <laughs> but there is a warning on there not to clear it while it's running. There you go. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Ah, oh, come on. Who turns off their power to change a light bulb? No one. Do you? Oh, okay. I still don't. That's how you know whether it's a good light bulb. <laughs> yeah, 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 it will. <laughs> I can see some people shutting off the whole power of the house. <laughs> Changing a light bulb. All right, so... Strict li product liability, other theories. So um, there's been a number of these cases over time. Like let's say you're taking a drug, an, a legal drug, um, like, um, I don't know, Tylenol or something. Let's, well, let's not use a brand name. But you're taking it, and it could come from different manufacturers. Then something bad happens to you. What's the problem? Well, besides something bad happened to you, you're not really sure which manufacturer caused your injury. Right? Later, you find out something's wrong with you, and when you think back about what you took that caused the problem, or you find out what caused the problem, turns out multiple manufacturers made the product that, that could have caused your harm. But there's no way of you proving which one did it. So in some cases, the court will use this market share liability and say, well, you're all liable. Get what that's saying? That's saying even though no one can prove you actually produced the product that caused the harm, because you produced the product that caused the harm, you're liable. In percentage to whatever your market share is. So if you own half the market, you pay half. I guess the argument is, is that that's better than leaving somebody without any recovery. And then we mentioned the last one on, a, on another slide, but all courts extend liability of manufacturers and sellers to bystanders. That means even people who didn't buy the product. So if the Coke explodes in the store, even though you're not the person that bought it, if it gets you in the eye, then you should be able to recover for that injury. Defenses. These should look familiar to you. Oops. Because remember negligence? These are most of these are from the other chapter. They apply in product liability cases too. What was assumption of the risk? Anybody remember that one? Would be. Right? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people say that. They're like, well, why would I sue in that case? I knew that this could happen, and I did it anyway. So, um, but what risk wouldn't you assume playing paintball? Go through your body, right? Or, yeah, or, yeah the mask just falls off and you get hit right in the face, right? Sue the mask manufacturer. Or um, it has some toxic chemical in that eats through your body. I don't know. 
thinking of things that you wouldn't expect, right? Because the point of this is you only assume risks normally associated with a product, not those that a reasonable person wouldn't anticipate. I think the example I used before was uh, getting punched at a sporting event. Uh, did I use that example? I don't know. But um, if you go to play basketball, that's basketball, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like you would think that maybe you might get hit by a stray basketball, but wasn't there some beer throwing involved in that or something? Right? Yeah. Yeah, whoops! Right, yeah, yeah, believe me, this is a defense. I am not saying that if something happens to you, you can't sue. People sue all the time for this stuff. It's just whether they'll ever see a recovery. I remember one time a dude, like, a basketball player, he actually, like, hit it backwards like a ball. Just barely hit a guy in the face. And he's, like, all crying and stuff. Just playing it up so he could get some money. <laughs> that could happen. Just yeah. Just yeah. Are you saying grown men can't cry? <laughs> Maybe it really hurt. All right, product misuse. Now, notice this one is severely limited. The argument is manufacturers need to warn people not to misuse products. So if they later try to say, oh, you misused the product, the court's like, well, yeah, you knew that could happen. But if it's a really crazy misuse, then usually manufacturers should anticipate those kind of things. Um, comparative negligence, that idea that, well, okay, maybe, maybe there is a defect or the manufacturer is negligent somehow, but so was the plaintiff. We mentioned commonly known dangers, knives or sharps, guns, if you shoot guns at people, they hurt. Uh, and then the knowledgeable user defense. I always struggle with this one, kind of the idea that, well, in that case about paintballs, the court said, not only is it common knowledge that you shouldn't shoot other people in the face with them, even if they have a mask on, it's not a good idea to shoot people in the face. Um, but these guys were um, like qualified on weapons and had taken hunter safety and all this other stuff. So they of all people, it's, that's kind of the defense. You of all people should have known better, right? So don't argue that you didn't know that if you shot at somebody while driving at high speed in a car at somebody's face, that that would hurt. Because right? you, all people, should know. Yeah. I don't know when you buy a Nerf gun, it says don't point at uh, people. Or <laughs> Isn't that what they're for? Yeah. So what are you supposed to do? Shoot up in the air? Well, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, I do think that's why they put it on there. Later when somebody says, I